Hey, Laura here. I'm gonna read you something. Hurts travel through time from one person to another. This unwanted heaviness moves from the past into the present and then into the future. One of the most heroic things anyone can do is break the line of hurt. When people heal themselves, they stop the hurt from multiplying and their relationships become healthier. When people heal themselves, they also heal the future. That's just one of many, many life-affirming entries in Young Pueblo's book, Clarity and Connection. Young Pueblo is the pen name for Diego Perez. With Clarity and Connection and his first book, Inward, Diego has been shining a light on a path for anyone who wants to heal and grow. And he's our guest for today's Tell Me Something True. We spent time talking about equanimity, the quality of calm, even composure, and why that can be one of the most valuable traits to develop. Presence, healing, balance, how to create a life that makes room for all of these things. We covered it all, and I got some fresh ideas about how to approach meditation, something that doesn't come easy or naturally to me at all. Enjoy. Welcome, Diego. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for having me, Laura. I'm happy to be here, too. Good. By the time this comes out, your book will have been out for a couple months, but I'm talking to you the week before the new book comes out, which is kind of a cool time. So talk to us about the new book that's called Clarity and Connection, and maybe touch on how this book feels different than Inward. Yeah, for sure. Inward was, I self-published it in 2017, and then it was reissued in 2018 and was like put in bookstores everywhere. But that first book was really all about personal transformation. It was just about you, the individual, and really trying to support whomever is reading it in understanding themselves a little bit better, building self-awareness, and also trying to understand nature a little better. Mm -hmm so that they could, you know, better flow with the changes that are constantly happening instead of resisting them. Clarity and connection is a bit different because it not only continues that work of focusing on personal transformation and just, you know, giving the individual a lot of reflective material so that they could, you know, think about themselves during the day or think about their own history, but it also expands. It tries to really focus in on our connections with other people, with our friends, with our family, with our intimate relationships, because that's one of the things that I've noticed in my own personal growth is that once I really went inward, I came out with new clarity and that clarity helped make my connections much deeper. It seems like the natural progression <laughs> of self-growth, maybe transformation. You're a proponent, obviously, of self-actualization and self-healing through meditation. It's a mm -hmm. huge part of your story, observation and internal work. You also cite the support of a community and activism is crucial to successful healing of ourselves and our culture. So the question is, how do we find balance between those things, between what we need to do for ourselves and what we need from others? I learned about it through not being balanced by them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, really mm -hmm. not, because I, I spent all of my late teens really deeply immersed in the world of activism, sp specifically organizing in Boston. I was part of this group called Boston Youth Organizing Project, where we were like making real changes in the city. It was just like a bunch of young people just getting things done, like whether on the city level or in our local schools. And it wasn't like service type work. It was real organizing where we were figuring out what was our common issue that we wanted to work on, whether it was like public transportation or guidance counselors or trying to improve some facet of our material lives. And I saw how we would set our mind on a particular project and we would really keep the pressure on our targets and we would get the results that we wanted to get. 
So it showed me pretty quickly how powerful a group of people could be if they came together around a common cause. But how old were you when you started doing that? 15, 14, 15. Okay, that's not a typical 14 year old, 15 year old thing to do. Yeah, so Boston's, what, what Boston's drew you not to a th- common place. <laughs> no, no, but still, what, what drew you to that? My brother, he knew about the group before I did, and he's five years older than I am. Mm-hmm. So as he was transitioning out of high school, and I was like transitioning into high school, he was like, oh, check this place out. And when I got in there, I just got, you know, immediately sucked in and involved. And it was cool because it was different from other types of, you know, nonprofits that you could be a part of. Because as soon as you came in, you were giving like real democratic power over the organization. And yeah. it was the type of place where it was totally youth led and adult supported. So like adults would be around and they would teach you how to organize and they'd teach you about your power. They teach you about different systems of oppression. But mm-hmm. then it was like up to the young people who were there to decide what do we want to work on? Who else do we want to include in this project? And how do we get from point A to point Z in this campaign? It isn't usual, but because it was my life, it just felt really normal. Sure. Um, but I'm curious about that instinct within you that is obviously still there, the passion, the drive that is within you as an activist, but how that looks today is different. What initially drove me in was just, I always, since I was very little, had a feeling that the world was like out of balance. Mm -hmm. Um, Things didn't seem quite right, especially growing up. Like we grew up extremely poor and Mm -hmm. we were under such constant hardships that it put so much pressure on my family. And I knew that some people were wealthy and some people were not. And it seemed just like abnormal to me that there would be people who had to materially struggle, like to had to like, you know, figure out how to put food on the table or pay their rent. And to this day, I still have the same feeling, you know, the the world. I mean, we've come such a long way, but we have a long ways to go in terms of making our world humane, you know, just building specific standards of like how to treat each other and how to live compassionately, like within a real structural compassion. Okay. So back to the original question Mm -hmm. then, which is, you know, how do you balance these things, the what I need and what others need? And it's interesting. I think to figure out that balance, I had to take a big step back. I was so immersed in the world of organizing from like, from 15 to like 26. And then when I took a big step back, when I was about 26, even though my healing journey like really started when I was 24, I needed to even more deeply address the roots of my like mental suffering. So I spent a lot more time, like I moved to a new city. I spent some like intentional time alone and started Um, Alone as in not dating? No, no, I was with my partner, but like alone as in just like not spending a lot of time with other people and specifically taking like a period of solitude to figure out if I really wanted to be a writer, Mm -hmm. but immersed, like interspersed in that time, I was, you know, going to retreats pretty often and just doing more silent 10 day Vipassana courses. But I think the balance, like it's something that's just like ongoing. Oftentimes we look for these perfect solutions, but Mm -hmm. As a writer, like I, I'm still a writer and I spend most of my time writing, so I'm not actively organizing. You know, I don't necessarily call myself an organizer or an activist. I think that's definitely what I've done in the past. Yeah. But to me, those are really active roles. So yeah. now I see myself like as a supporter and like I go to protests and I put boots on the ground just like everybody else when it's time to go outside and like really yeah. make our voices heard. But I'm not yeah. leading those movements in the way I was when I was younger. Yeah. I th- like that you said I got there by being out of balance. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, it, me too. I think balance is mostly a myth in the way that we talk about it in common culture because I think what that means is how do we do it all? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And yeah. like what, I can only really do one thing at a time. So like right <laughs> yeah. now I'm writing and like I don't know what I'm going to do in the future. You know, like to me, Young Pueblo, all this like writing that I've been doing, it really is a project, but I might go back into organizing depending mm-hmm. on like what is my intuition telling me? What's this new volition that comes up? So I try to leave the future open because I can only do one thing at a time. I could do a few things, you know, within a small amount of time, but I'm really more so focused on trying to do the few things that I like commit to really well. So right now it's like writing, you know, finishing the book that I just made, Clarity and Connection, and writing another book after that. Right. You talk about a decade ago or so you had a transformative experience that revealed the possibilities of true healing to you. Uh, it's, I, I believe it was your, your first extended meditation retreat. 
mm-hmm. maybe in 2012. 12, yeah. Okay. So can you talk about what your life was like, your daily life, both inner and outer, were like before you went on that retreat? What was going on? Mm. Before I went on the retreat, I had already started digging deep into like two particular things. It was radical honesty and positive habit building. In the summer of 2011 was when I had my big crash, when I like hit rock bottom and realized that I needed to just like radically transform my life or else I was going to die early. What was Um, that? Take us there first. What was that? What was that like for you? Um, it was horrible. <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> yes, rock bottom yeah. generally. Uh, yeah, it means that, <laughs> but it means something different for everyone. Totally, like. totally. And I also don't think it's necessary for everyone to build a better life. That's just the route that I was like the tra- trajectory that I set myself on. But my habits had gotten so out of control, and they were so unhealthy. And I was so um, just like obsessed with filling my body with a sensation of pleasure either through drugs or through always being around friends or always partying or always consuming something or another, it had just taken me to this point where I was just incredibly unhealthy and miserable. I was so focused on not admitting how sad I was (laughs) that I would try to just like fill myself with this like really vapid, superficial fun. And yeah, it just culminated in one night where I, you know, took too many different drugs and I felt like I was having a heart attack and I was just like on the floor there basically willing myself back into life and realizing, I think it was like the day after or two, we were just really, really realizing that um, what got me there was lying to myself. Um, That's an amazing insight to have. Yeah. I mean, um, it was just clear then after those days, like how did I get there? It was, I was lying to myself. I was just totally not admitting what was happening. And then I knew that to get myself out of that hole, I would have to be honest with myself. No small thing. (laughs) No small thing. So you started down this path of, you said, radical honesty and positive habit building. Okay. And then at some point you decided to do this. You must have Mm -hmm. been turned on to meditation before that because one does not generally just go on a silent. Well, maybe you did. No, no, no. I was was not interested in meditation at all. (sighs) It was really funny. I meditated (laughs) once with my wife for like 20 minutes and we didn't know what we were doing at all. No Uh instruction. We just sat there burn 20 minutes and then like it was like oh that's that's not that good you know and then just kept living our lives <laughs> <laughs> yeah i ended up finding out about it through my friend sam he did a course and he was just like so different afterwards that mm. i was on this like personal transformation journey like I, I didn't call it that back then i was just like i'm trying to fix my life I'm trying but to not die and be miserable trying to not die yeah and make something of like just you know, make good use of the opportunity my parents gave me. But when I really was, you know, I was making progress, like I was healthier, I I felt better, but I knew I needed something deeper. And when my friend came out of his course, I was just like so impressed by what he wrote to me because he was in India at the time. Mm. He was like just talking about love, compassion, and goodwill. And I had never really heard him talk about these things before. And something inside me clicked was like, oh, you know, I got to try that too. And, and it was a meditation um, retreat that he did or? Yeah, I just signed up. I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but I was like, okay, 10 days sounds hard, but I think I can do it. And that was just like one of the most important decisions of my life. <laughs> mm-hmm. Isn't that wild how that happens? You sort of follow these breadcrumbs and you just trust some kind of intuition in you and it can lead to this radical change in the trajectory of your life. I've heard you talk about a specific time in that meditation retreat where, or that course where you experienced something that was different? People are always looking for one moment. And then, you know, I'm, I'm always like, it's like, it's a series of moments, you know, and sure. it's all these things building up together. But no, there wasn't like a specific moment. What I really remember from it was that it was grueling. It was really hard. <laughs> like I'd never been silent for 10 days and I never meditated for hours and hours and hours a day. So everything that I was doing was just brand new. I think the real moment came after the retreat, just like the few days after. I feel like my mind had lost weight. Like I just had Mm. lost this like burden that I was carrying in my mind. I didn't feel like fully healed or anything, but I felt better. I felt like I can think more clearly. I can feel more compassion like in my mind, in my heart. For you or for everything? 
for me and for everything. And that yeah. wasn't something that was like really strong within me before at all. I felt like it was funny because I could, in the past, I could feel much more compassion for like the world. Like as an organizer, you have to have a bit of a love for the world to like do this type of work. But yep. I had less compassion for individuals. And now this yeah. was like a switch was like, oh, I have, you know, the, the love for the world is there, but there's more love for individuals that wasn't huh. really there before. But that feeling of my mind just being less dense just motivated me to keep going back and to keep putting myself through that difficult process because I was getting results that I had never seen before that I didn't, you know, results that I didn't even really believe because I was like, what's going on here? Like, am I suppressing? I was like, is this a new type of lying or something like that? Because mm -hmm. I wanted to be really Am I chasing something? Yeah, exactly. But then the tests came later, like during difficult moments that would happen in life. And I would notice like, oh, there's no suppression here. It's just the reaction has decreased. The reaction mm -hmm. isn't as intense as it used to be. So there's something here. And that's like literally what the goal of that technique is equanimity. And that's what I was gaining in my life. It's just that equanimity was so foreign that I didn't even know how to like deal with it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny that you say that because when I read your words, that is the essence of what I feel in your words is equanimity. That's the word that always comes to mind mm. is equanimity. And that's not even, it's the energy in the words. And I think as a writer and as a avid reader, you can read the same thing written by many different people, but it will make you feel differently based on who wrote it and what's actually transmitting into those words. So equanimity, it, it did make its way into you because I think that's what you transmit among other things. Thank you. That's so kind of you to say, yeah, I'm, I have this relationship in my life with impermanence and equanimity. Impermanence is the most fundamental thing that I'm trying to understand in this life and equanimity is what I'm trying to develop. And mm. between the two, I try to live my life. <laughs> but yeah, equanimity is like, it's real happiness, that balance of mind to not be constantly reacting, to not be constantly craving or having aversion, to just see reality as it is and allow it to flow the way it's flowing. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm the executive producer of the podcast. At TMST, we're passionate about having conversations that bring us together and help us stoke our love of life. That's why we created a dedicated site for the show. It's free. It's not a Facebook group. And we aren't mining your data to target you with ads. So check it out. And while you're there, please join TMST Plus, our paid membership group. TMST Plus members will play the critical role in keeping this going and ad-free. There are no corporations backing us. There's no advertisers. I mean, it's really up to us to pull together and make it happen. You can make a one-time contribution, or you can join our monthly program, where you can help shape the show, hear the complete unedited interviews, and join regular online experiences with Laura. But know this, you can make a huge difference right now for as little as $10 a month. You can find the link in the show description, and then please head over to tmstpod.com right now and join us. seen you mention that your wife meditates with you now did she just come right along on the med what because this i think is a challenge for people too in partnerships where one person grows at a different time yeah yeah and you know how has that looked for you it looked exactly like that we grew at very different speeds we were both immediately interested in taking a course but then i was the one who started sitting two hours a day before she did, like months before, like I think like nine months before she did. And afterwards, it just kind of clicked inside her and she decided to, you know, come along for the ride as well. Because she had to go through her own process. She had to figure out like, was this for her? Because even at that time, I think we were like looking at other 
styles of meditation, like should mm-hmm. we, you know, take this route or that route? But then when it clicked that, you know, Vipassana was was for the both of us, like let's let's take it seriously. And similarly, there was like a point when we both started realizing that smoking weed, drinking alcohol just like wasn't serving us anymore. But she was ready to give all that up before I was, like mm-hmm. a few months before. And then mm-hmm. Like, I remember feeling bad that she was able to give it up so quickly. You, and then you, it I, was harder for you. It was hard. Yeah, it was hard to not be like, to not have someone by my side doing the same thing. Yeah. And also because I, I did want to give it up, but I wasn't quite ready to. But I was so grateful for the patience that she gave me and just like letting me go through my own process. And then like a few months passed and then it clicked and I was like, okay, I'm ready now. And I'm ready to really give it up and put my foot down. And yeah, we just we just grow at different speeds even to this day. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and of course we do. Of course we do. Mm-hmm. So what is the relationship to you between substances and meditation? What led you to the decision that it doesn't belong in your life anymore? Yeah, that's a good question. So at that point, I had already like dwindled the amount of intoxicants that I had taken to like a very small amount. Mm-hmm. But I had started meditating two hours a day before I gave up intoxicants. So I was like doing both simultaneously. And hour was, in the morning, hour in the evening. Exactly. But what I would notice was that when I would go like periods of times without consuming intoxicants or without, you know, taking alcohol, my mind felt sharper and my mind felt a lot less dense. So I had this inkling. I was like, when you go to a retreat, you're there for 10 days and you're obviously not drinking or smoking or anything. Right. And your mind just like clears up and then it has this like beautiful, pristine quality that supports your awareness, supports your equanimity, supports you to go even deeper mm-hmm. and to gain more wisdom. And at that point, I was like, okay, I think this isn't for me anymore because one, like I'm not really getting a lot. And this is, you know, people live their own lives and then go through their own journeys. So I'm yeah. not trying to impose my life onto others. Yeah, I'm just no. talking about my story. Mm-hmm. But um, it just clicked that like I'm getting such little from smoking now like I think in the past when I was younger I was actually gaining a lot because it was like some system that was helping me just not get overwhelmed by everything that was happening yeah. but then it quickly became a bad habit that just helped me escape from it without dealing with it and the, the escape wasn't really real but the moment I stopped you know I just felt like that was like a key pivotal moment of like an inner renaissance began you know, when I, when I like stopped mm-hmm. drinking and smoking, continued meditating two hours a day, my mind just went through such deep mental and physical healing, like on the mental level of my contents of the mind, but the yeah. physical level of my mind, like there was just so much more clarity flowing. Mm-hmm. And I was able to take that and just make good use of it in meditating. And um, it really just radically changed the relationship my wife and I had. Yeah, I bet. I re- always remember this story that I heard, you know, Wayne Dyer, it's like an old school sort of self-help guy, maybe consider spiritual guy. I don't know. He talks about, he studied with Maslow and he was drinking consistently, but never say problematically. No one would yeah. say he was an alcoholic or anything like that, but he consistently had a couple beers every night He after mm-hmm. his long runs. And Maslow eventually said, like, I know the levels of consciousness that you want to reach. And if you want to get there, alcohol just has no place in your life. And I remember hearing (laughs) that long before I got sober. And there were many other reasons I had to get sober, you know, survival-ish type of reasons. But Mm -hmm. that really stuck with me. And, And the reason I'm bringing that up is because beyond sort of the immediate effects that alcohol or drugs or intoxicants can have on our day to day life. There's like another layer that we don't really know of what's possible within ourselves, within our own minds. And it feels like that's part of what you've discovered about mm. yourself is, is that call it the hidden 25% or I don't know what you call it. It's like we don't even know what's possible. I don't know. You know, I'm so glad that you're bringing this up because I've never really gone to speak about it in depth. It's funny because it feels like we're talking about a secret, but um, it's <laughs> I like, know we're like getting quiet. We're getting, yeah, we're getting like hushing <laughs> up. Um, so my, my okay. So to be really honest, my experience was that I could feel the meditation making my mind lighter. It was just mm-hmm. that's the word that I can use, like literally making it lighter. And then even when I would, you know, smoke marijuana, drink alcohol, or even take mushrooms, it mm-hmm. felt like the meditation had helped me 
go to a much subtler level. And then when I would take these things, it would bring me to a denser level. And it's funny because I remember when I was growing up and like the memes at the time and all the things that were around in social media, there was a lot about how marijuana and like psychedelics can help you make your mind very subtle. And I totally think that's true. But meditation just like for me personally, it just went so much deeper that when I did try those things in the past, again, after having started meditated, I was like, oh, this isn't for me anymore. Like it's only bringing up the same type of intellectualized wisdom. And Mm. whereas meditation was you were gaining wisdom through direct experience and you were just literally solely using the power of your mind to better understand the universe as opposed to having some sort of medium that was helping you do that. Yeah. When I recognize I'm like, man, this meditation is trying to make my mind light. Why am I making it heavy? I just got to let go of that stuff. That's a really interesting way to put it. And a lot of people, and this is also zero judgment, won't know what that feels like because it's just sort of foregone conclusion that we use substances, even, Mm -hmm. even subtle ones, you know, as humans, we just do. And so let's just talk briefly about finding a practice that works for you, but doesn't overwhelm you. Yeah. We've spent all this time talking about meditating a lot. And I find that it's a tool that works great for me. It really meets my conditioning. It helps me make my strong points stronger, and it helps develop my weak points in a sustainable manner. But from what I've noticed, and we all have such different conditioning, like our emotional histories are just on this really vast spectrum. So some people have experienced very little trauma. Other people have experienced immense, immense amounts of trauma. So what I try to tell people is that there's something out there for you that will help you heal. The amount that you want to heal is dependent on you, how far you want to go. But what I'm trying to do is just give people a little bit of inspiration and encouragement to at least in this lifetime, take a few steps forward from wherever you are, right? Yeah. Build a little more self-love, know yourself a little more, have a little more compassion towards yourself and other people. And those few steps forward that you may take they will help you cause less harm to yourself and to other people. Mm. And if more and more people take those steps forward, that will cause a massive amount of change in our world. But how you take those steps forward, the tools that you use, the method, it's going to be different for different people. And I think that's one of the positive sides of living in a globalized world now is that we have access to such a wide variety of tools. Like we can go much further. So many more people have access to meditation. So many more people have access to therapy. And then outside of that journaling, and there's all these different methods of helping you build self-awareness and self-love. So to me, you need to find your own a method that will help you just get to know yourself better but that it just won't make it overwhelming because sometimes it becomes too much where too much stuff comes up and then you're going to want to run away from the process. And that's not what we want, right? We want something that's sustainable, something that you can keep going back to, that you can be diligent about, whether that's therapy, meditating or something else, you know, things that I don't even know about. What matters is that real personal transformation is happening. Do you have any thoughts for people on how to find something? You know? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think the most common one is like Googling, like Google, <laughs> oh, Google? Like, how do I, you know, deal with my anxiety? Mm-hmm. And you're going to find so many things. Mm-hmm. And also, I definitely want to say too, like, sometimes the avenue is Western medicine, like for a lot of people, mm-hmm. like I've seen one on one therapy work incredibly well. I've also seen psychiatry stop people from committing horrible acts to themselves. Yes. So it's literally about whatever will help you not only bring a sense of stability into your life, but then also a sense of progress that you're, you are taking that steps into your growth. So wherever that beginning point is for you, honor it and start. Yeah. And just trying things, just really being willing to try, I think has been my experience. And then my experience is once we open ourselves, and this is what echoes in your story so far throughout is once we start on a path, the universe, the world however you want to phrase it, responds. And new things come up, new people show up in our lives. You might get an email 
you know, or, or see a post or something that, and just following those, the breadcrumbs, the next breadcrumb and the next breadcrumb and the next breadcrumb. It's wild too. Cause like, I, I remember when I was really young and I was trying to figure out where I was going to go to college. Mm-hmm. And for some weird unknown reason, I was like adamant, like I have to go to Wesleyan, even huh. though I'd never visited the place. I never even really knew about it. I remember finding it through a magazine about colleges and I was like oh yeah that one I gotta go to that Isn't that one. so funny? I yeah. felt the same way about Boston. I yeah. had never been here. I'd never been east of Chicago. I was from yeah. Colorado. The name of this town just like struck something in me. Oh totally totally and the intuition starts roaring and then like just starts like molding reality for it to come true and it's yes. funny because then at Wesleyan like I met not only the person who told me about Vipassana but I met my wife and all my other best friends. So it was so even though I had such a hard time there, it was like critical that I have that hard time there. And yes. you know, and I got so much benefit from that. Yes. You have a massive following on social media and you seem to be one of those people that uses it well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so curious about this personally, but I, I know a lot of other people will be too. I just recently left social media. I couldn't do it. It was making Mm. me very mentally ill. And it was like drinking for me. I tried to find a way to make it work and I just couldn't. But I can see, you know, it's been a huge benefit to me in growing my own career and publishing my first book. So what's your relationship with it? It's a beautiful up and down relationship. It's like, (laughs) it's just like all the others. It's funny. I, I think that's one of the reasons why it really felt right to do it all under a pen name. Yeah. So even early on, like in 2014 was when I really was like, okay, let me start writing. You know, like I'm not fully healed or anything like that. Nothing special happened to me. I just feel a little bit better. And I felt creativity flowing. But I don't know, something felt right about putting everything that I was going to share under a pen name and then not really featuring myself, like my face. I don't want to make my face famous. Like that's never my goal. You know, I want to be able to like live my life privately. Um, Mm. So I I do do podcasts and like sometimes other media events. But when you go to my page, it's going to be a little hard. Like you can see the tiny little icon that has my face, but it's a tiny little icon. It's almost there's like there's no ego in in on that. And that's one of the main things that I'm trying to do is like I try to be really careful with how is this affecting me? Like, is this bringing my mood up? Is it bringing it down? Is it growing my ego? Is it making it smaller? So I'm constantly having this like self-analysis where I'm trying to make sure that I use this as any other tool Mm -hmm. as opposed to like making it dominate the way that I see myself. Because if my ego is growing, then I'm not making progress in meditation. You know, Mm -hmm. so it's like critical that I handle this well. So I try to create a lot of space in terms of like, you know, how often I go on, how many things I respond to, how often I post so that it's all very limited and it is set up in a way where it supports my mental health as opposed to hurting it. Because if, you know, like I can't respond to every message and I can't like respond to every email because it would just, it would take up too much of my time and I wouldn't be able to nourish myself the way I need to, to be creative at all. If I just did everything everyone wanted me to do for them. (laughs) Amen to that. There's the being on it as the person you are or the creator that you are but there's also the ingesting it ingesting it is yeah totally and i think so do even, you do you really like, limit that yeah i do and even ingesting the positive sides of it too mm-hmm. i don't think are that good like mm-hmm. having a lot of people congratulate you like I, you know for me like internally i'm so happy that my work serves you but it's not that good for me to to read like all these like really positive things all the time because I'm just like a regular person, just like everybody else, you know? Yes. I just happened to write and I got fortunate on social media. That's great. And again, I think it's one of those things that everyone has to decide their own experience and what works for them, no matter what it is. I could not figure out a way to not have it pull me in all directions. And and I finally, after six years, got to the point where I said, okay, then, you know, maybe that's just the way it is for me and I'll find other ways. Yeah, and it's something that is incredibly energy consuming. Like, yes. just like even taking in all the memes, taking in all the words, constantly reading all this stuff, scrolling. It's funny because one of the best things 
that I like really enjoy for myself when I go to courses, when I go to retreats is like, you know, I put my phone in a lockbox and I put my valuables in a lockbox so that I just don't have to worry about them during the course Mm. and having to like, you know, to turn my phone off and it's just like the best thing. It's like, I'm not waiting for any text messages. I'm not waiting for, you know, nothing. Like it's just me and my mind and me meditating and that's it. So along these lines of social media, people tend to jump to conclusions. We all do. (laughs) And in many cases, I believe react, not having equanimity or not having a pause between what we see and what we do about it or what we feel and what we do about it and what we think and what we do about it. You write about having emotional maturity and humility to avoid hasty judgments. So how do you practice this in your real life? One thing especially that I try to do is like those moments of difficulty when like a storm comes up or something is happening inside you where like old stuff is just coming up. Mm -hmm. I allow myself to just be a little more quiet because I know that because my mind is already going through something, my immediate perceptions are already clouded. So if I'm going to like just quickly make all these valuations and assessments of things, the first reaction is often just like it's the past. It's literally just like how I would have reacted to things before. And that's something you've learned. Yeah, just like through observing myself. But the response, like after that, like what's my, you know, the the immediate response after that, after the reaction, that will give me like a better sense of like how far I've come. So like if something comes up and I immediately deal with like aversion and I'm like, oh, like, you know, I don't want to be dealing with this. But then it's like, Mm -hmm. then you take a, a breath and you're like actually let me deal with this with compassion if someone's like wants me to do something and i'm already really busy and i feel stressed and it's like okay like let me just honestly tell them like this is what i can and can't do and this is how i can move forward but at the same time not think of anyone as bad but just like send them love you know deal with all beings with love So that's one thing that I try to really like stick to and like build that habit is just not let the immediate reaction run away with me and just like allow myself that spaciousness in my mind to, okay, let me see that was my past, but now let me see how would I deal with this in the present. And I think for a lot of people, the way that a lot of us grew up, it's like you think that that immediate reaction is your authentic self. But yes. it's like, no way, dude, that's, that's just your past. <laughs> and your response, like that's gives you a better sense of who you are now. Yes. The word that was coming to mind when you're talking is just space, just more yeah. space in space. general. Mm-hmm. Space, we're so immediate. Yeah. And yeah. there's space between everything if you allow it, really. There's so much more space. So I would love for you to read. I think this is the first time I'm reading from my book. Oh, really? Good. Yeah. Good. Thanks I'm... so much for holding space. Yes. So nice. A real conversation, free from projection and ego flexing, is a special gift. Most do not talk to listen. They talk to be heard. Self-awareness, selflessness, and a real desire to listen are required for mutually authentic and honest exchange. Thank you. I love that you used the word flexing. Yeah. My, my daughter would appreciate that too. Yeah. <laughs> Time does not heal all wounds. It just gives them space to sink into the subconscious, where they will continue to impact your emotions and behavior. What heals is going inward, loving yourself, accepting yourself, listening to your needs, addressing your attachments and emotional history, learning how to let go, and following your intuition. Three thoughts. Relationships normally start with two people wanting to treat each other well. Harm is caused when someone does not know how to properly manage their reactions to their emotions. If you think you are your emotions, then your words and actions will resemble your mental turbulence. In relationships, it is important to understand that the other person cannot fix your emotional problems. At best, they can support you as you uncover and process your own emotional history. There is no such thing as a perfect relationship, but there are 
incredible relationships in which the mutual connection and support are indescribably profound. I love that you wrote so much about relationships in this, in this one. Thank you. Yeah, I was like really, I had to like gather up the courage to do that. I was like, I don't have a perfect relationship, but you know, my wife and I have really come a long way because like we used to live in a hurricane together. And really? Because of your own <laughs> stuff? Just because of our own stuff. Yeah. Like our own ignorance. Yeah. Um, we didn't know ourselves and we didn't know each other well. So it was just flowing between like calmness and chaos. And most of the time it was chaos. Yeah. But now we have a little more calmness than chaos. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The balance is tipped. Yeah. Yeah. There is no perfect relationship, as you know. It's But you articulated it beautifully in that third point. And personally, I am amazed at your ability to distill concepts and communicate them so well. It's truly a gift. And it's been a gift to me for many years now. It's wonderful to actually see you and talk to you and put a face to these words I mostly had on Instagram until a while ago before I bought your book. And I share them all the time in my sobriety support meetings. You're oh, beloved you so to people who are recovering, which is a, a huge compliment. When people are in recovery, entering recovery, contemplating it, trying, they're yeah. in a lot of pain. And yeah. your words provide a really beautiful space for them to go through what they're going through. Thank you so much. That really means a lot, especially in such a delicate space. It's nice to know that um, people are finding value in the words because that's the, so, the challenge I give myself is like, may I make something useful? You absolutely are. And I think one of the really neat things is that it crosses all ages, classes and races and genders. I mean, I have a mix of people and one of the men that works for me is this, you know, in his 60s, he's been sober 30 years. And He's like an old timer in AA, you know, mm -hmm, and he mm -hmm. reads your work in our meetings. And it's just like, Aww, oh, my God. That's yeah, so it's sweet. so it's beautiful. It's such an honor. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It was beautiful to meet you. And hopefully it won't be the last time. Yeah, no, th thank you so much for having me. And this has been such a joy. You can go deeper on today's episode with Diego when you head over to tmstpod.com right now. We'll link you to his latest book, Clarity and Connection. And while you're there, plug into the TMST online community. It's not a Facebook group and it's ad free. And now I want to share something that is extremely important and relevant to you. Do you notice there aren't any ads on TMST? That's by design. We want to keep this show and our digital spaces ad-free, but that's a goal we can only accomplish if we work together. Yes, please follow, rate, review, and share all the things you hear in a podcast. But even more important than all of that, we would love you to engage in our online community. Head over to tmstpod.com to connect with folks around this episode. And while you're there, please become a subscribing member. The TMST subscribing members will play the critical role in keeping this going and ad-free. There are no corporations backing us, no sponsors, so it's really up to us. You can make a one-time contribution or join our monthly program where we have cool opportunities for you to help shape the show, hear the complete unedited interviews, and connect with other TMST folks. So I can't stress this enough. You could make a huge difference for as little as $10 a month. Please head over to tmstpod.com right now. Coming up next time, someone I admire a great deal, Peter Rollins. Think of him as your friend from Ireland who asks all the best questions about faith and psychology and belonging and is just the very best hang. You're gonna love him. Tell Me Something True is engineered and mixed by Paul Chufo. Jeff Whittington was a producer for this episode. Michael Elsesser and I dreamed up this show and we're looking forward to joining you online and next time on Tell Me Something True.